Good evening, brothers. We'll give it just a moment to allow more participants to join and then we'll get started for tonight. Hi, right, brothers. Again, good evening. My name is Dio Protopapadakis. I'm the Senior Director of Graduate Engagement for Pi Gamma Delta. I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight for our House Corporation webinar, um, what we're calling Ask the Legal Experts. Tonight with us, we have Alana Linder from Fraternal Law Partners uh, to present on a variety of topics and as well um, as answer a bunch of questions that you all may have uh, related to either the House Corporation, the structure, or anything in between. Um, a few key points before I turn it over to Alana. First, brothers, as you join in, be sure to mute yourself during the presentation. We'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. But when we get to the Q&A, please feel free to utilize the Q&A box or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen as we get started um, and throughout the presentation. So once we get to the end of the presentation, feel free to raise your hand. We'll moderate the discussion as needed. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to Alana. Thank you very much. As I pull this up, I actually um, will share with you guys something I was thinking about as I was making this, which is the last time I think I made a presentation in the spring. Usually I give these sorts of presentations in the fall. Um, I think it was back when I was in law school and I went to IU in Bloomington. And if anybody's familiar with where the... Um, the law school is located, it actually was right next door to the Fiji house. And I remember having Fiji blaring music in the background of a narrated PowerPoint I was trying to create my, my last year of law school. So it seems like I've come full circle here. But anyways, um, I will get right to it. We've got a lot of information to get through. I cannot see you guys anymore. Well, I guess I can do this. So i um, if questions come up, I'm not going to be able to monitor them. Can you guys still see the full screen if I have this up? Okay, good. Um, so my name is Alana. As he mentioned, I'm an attorney with Fraternal Law Partners, which is a division of the Manley Berg Law Firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. We do a lot of types of law. No, there we go. Um, so just a little bit about us. It's a smaller firm in Cincinnati. Like I said, it's part of a larger general civil law firm. Um, but we represent national fraternities, sororities, their house corporations, and their foundations. We kind of do it all. We do a little bit for some groups, and we do everything for other groups. Um, we also have the Fraternal Law Newsletter, which is a free resource. You can either access it through our website each month, or you can actually sign up to be um, on our mailing list, and then you'll just get it. It comes out about four to five times a year. And we're always looking for contributing um, authors. So if you're ever interested in writing an article, please reach out to me. I'm the editor of it now. We also have an annual fraternal law conference. We hold it here in Cincinnati each year. It's usually the first um, Thursday and Friday in November. And then we also have the anti-hazing hotline that um, we've been running <clears throat> since 2007. So we do a lot of different types of law. I'm not going to go through all of these. I will tell you a little bit about what I do in addition to helping Sean Callen, who some of you may know, and John Christopher with housing and the sorts of stuff. Um, I actually also do a lot of investigations on behalf of fraternities and sororities. And when I say that, I mean internal investigations. The most common ones I've seen lately, particularly with fraternities, unfortunately, is um, if there's a female, let's say, in a sorority that is wanting to bring forth allegations of sexual misconduct against a fraternity member, but the, the alleged victim doesn't want to go to the police, they don't want to go to the university, but they want something done, usually that gets reported to somebody in the chapter who kind of reports it up, and then National sometimes hires us to do investigations that are private, um, they're just fact-finding investigations. So that's a great service we offer. I also do a lot of work defending um, chapters when they're about to be kicked off campus by universities. So I've made a lot of enemies from across different universities in doing so, but um, that that's becoming more and more important in the housing context. And, and I'll touch on this at the very end, 
in terms of zoning. In some jurisdictions, if you lose your university recognition, you can no longer be zoned a fraternity or sorority under the, um, the local zoning code. So it can have serious implications that people don't necessarily always think about. Here's the lawyer disclaimer. Uh, nothing I'm about to say is to be construed as legal advice. If there's ever a question, certainly consult your own attorney, whether that's fraternal law partners or somebody else. But um, and what I'm going to present tonight is more just intended as an overview and for informational purposes only. All right. So these are kind of the broad categories I want to talk about. Like I said, at the end, I'll have a couple that I'll quickly touch upon that aren't listed here. But the big one, the really big hot, hot topic lately are just becoming more and more reasonable accommodation requests, people trying to get out of their lease agreement. So we'll look at the Fair Housing Act and what sorts of accommodation requests um, are being made and what those require from a house corporation. We'll also look at what some of your roles are as a member of the board of directors and maybe whether you should consider um, not having chapter members on your board of directors. And we'll go through that. We'll also take a look at your occupancy agreements, and in there, I'm going to emphasize the difference between having the structure of leasing directly from the house corporation to the to the individual members versus leasing to the chapter and then having the chapter sublease it out to the individual members. We'll briefly touch on security cameras and whether we recommend having them or not, and then, um, of course, what to do when people are not paying their dues, not paying their room and board, and you need to get them out, perhaps. So without further ado, we'll start with the Fair Housing Act. And I apologize if some of you already know this, but I want to give a little bit of a background on the Fair Housing Act before we get into the actual application so you kind of understand where we're coming from. So this, obviously, pro pro the Fair Housing Act, generally speaking, prohibits discrimination in housing on a variety of different bases, including sex and disability. However, there is an exception within exemption within the Fair Housing Act for single family, single sex fraternities and sororities. So you are allowed to limit occupancy in your houses to only your members um, without violating the Fair Housing Act. However, um, what's important to know is that you cannot also discriminate within the ranks of your membership. So while you can limit who's allowed to live in the house, once they're allowed to be in the house, you the Fair Housing Act still applies and you need to accommodate um, disability requ um, accommodation requests you cannot discriminate on the basis of a disability. And that's really what we're seeing come up a lot. So again, you can discriminate against about who lives in your house in terms of members versus non-members, but you can't then discriminate against disabled versus non-disabled members that are allowed to live in the house otherwise. Um, so these are kind of the broad three categories that we are seeing come up in terms of the Fair Housing Act. And it, it prohibits discrimination against persons with disabilities and then it requires two things. It requires the housing providers to make reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities. And it also requires um, reasonable modifications be permitted. It, these are used interchangeably and I will use them interchangeably going forward in this presentation. Just so you know, the difference between a reasonable accommodation versus a modification, a reasonable accommodation is like a change to an existing policy or rule to make um, something feasible for a disabled person. So for example, if you have a, a policy that says no animals are allowed to be in the house, if somebody needs a service dog, then it would be an accommodation, basically an exception to your existing rules. Reasonable modifications, the easiest way to think about those are if you um, if somebody is in a, in a wheelchair, for example, and they need a ramp to be able to actually physically get into the property or they need grab bars in the showers, those are modifications that could be made that um, are really kind of unique to that person. Okay, so without going too far into this, I, I wanna touch broadly on some different issues. This was a question I was actually asked by a different group, but I think it's a really good question that I wanna go over here very quickly and it kind of leads very nicely into what I'm about to be talking about. With COVID, we've seen all sorts of issues come up. Um, COVID has kind of been become the, the masking word for any sort of issue nowadays, it seems. But I think this, this question is applicable in, in a multitude of different environments. And that is basically, if for some reason somebody needs a single room, whereas normally we would only have double rooms, can we charge that person twice as much since we're going to only be able to put one person in that double room? going forward. And I think what's important to remember here and with all considerations is that at the end of the day, we're talking about contractual obligations 
that's what these lease agreements are. They're contractual obligations for people who sign them and for people who sign up to live in the house. So if you are simply insisting upon people honoring the terms to which they already agreed to, it's not going to be considered discrimination. Again, as long as you are complying with the Fair Housing Act, which we're going to go through here in a minute. So it, it's sometimes difficult to set aside emotions. But at the end of the day, keep in mind that this is a basically a landlord tenant relationship for the most part, and that we're dealing with a contract. So if somebody is not going to live in a, if somebody wants a double room and they're, it's not necessarily medically necessary, then they, they may be able to be charged the same amount, the, the higher rate, but look at what your leases say essentially. Okay, so what is a reasonable accommodation? A reasonable accommodation is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, or practice, or service that may be necessary for a person with disabilities to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. And that last part is the, the important part here. It's not just, is this absolutely necessary for them to survive or to be able to get into the house? It's a matter of, is this necessary for them to be able to get the same benefits or is close enough to the same benefits of living in the house as somebody who is not disabled would have. So some of the common requests, and this goes back to what I was mentioning about the difference between reasonable accommodations versus modifications. The ones you're gonna see the most common are going to be requests to make physical changes. Again, that would be like a ramp instead of steps. Um, requests for relief from policies or rules. So that's gonna be something like the pet policy or um, the live-in requirement, or altogether release from the con con contract, excuse me. And um, that's basically to somebody who doesn't want to live in the house at all anymore. So if you have an obligation to live in for X number of semesters and the person just doesn't want to anymore, um, that that might be where you see a request becoming coming in from. There's a lot of different factors to consider. I don't have time to go through all of them, but these are some of the big ones. And you'll see kind of uh, these themes repeating themselves throughout. But number one is why are they making the request? Is it just a personal preference that they would rather live in a cooler place off campus? Is it that their family's having financial issues and that it would be cheaper to live elsewhere? Or is this like a straight up me like medical or health issue that actually is justified by medical documentation? Um, or are they just deciding to disaffiliate from the organization altogether? Um, so think about that. Also look at obviously what your housing agreements say. If if you keep in mind that these are contracts, enforceable contracts, and you also know what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do under the Fair Housing Act, a lot of these questions become pretty simple, even though at first glance, they may seem a little bit overwhelming. You also want to think about alternative options. We're going to come back to this, but I want you to remember that alternative options, just because an alternative option may exist, doesn't mean that the person is required to accept an alternative option, um, but that'll come back come up again here when we talk about um, the interactive process that's required. And then also just kind of looking at balancing the options long term of whether to grant an accommodation. Sometimes it may be a pain in the butt, honestly, up front to accommodate something, but it could save you a lot of money to avoid a lawsuit if somebody is mad at the end of the day, if you deny a an accommodation. You also want to look at, for example, in the dog context, if you allow a dog in, but then you have other residents who have a dog allergy, what sort of um, kind of ripple effect is this going to have or potentially have? And you have to balance different things. Now, again, we'll come back to this, but just because it's a little difficult doesn't mean you're off the hook, but it is something to keep in mind. Okay. So medical excuses, and I don't see these as much in the fraternity context as I do in the sorority context, but they do pop up here and there. So I'm going to go through them. Um, usually these excuses, and I'm using the word excuses intentionally um, here, is, they're to avoid contractual obligations. Um, the only way to, for somebody to actually get out of a lease and break it is through the disability framework. If they're just like, and this is going to sound morbid, but if somebody dies, technically they're still probably on the hook for the lease. Now, there may be a clause in there that says inability to perform. But my point is, if somebody just gets sick um, and doesn't want to live in the house anymore, that's not necessarily a medical ex justification. There has to be like a disability framework for the Fair Housing Act to be applying here. And what I have here at the bottom, we're going to come back to this, is that medical excuses should be considered in the same framework framework 
as emotional service animals. And there's a pretty robust consideration that goes into emotional um, support animals that I'll come back here in a minute. But keep in mind, you can use that same analysis that I'll go through for, for these medical excuses. Okay, so when somebody comes to you and says, hey, I have a, an accommodation request, there are certain things you can ask for and certain things you cannot ask for. You are allowed to ask for supporting documentation unless the disability is overtly clear. So if, for example, somebody comes to you in a wheelchair and says, hey, there's five steps to get into the house, I'm going to need some sort of accommodation, you can't then go require that person to go get a, a letter from their doctor confirming that they do indeed need it. So if it's, if it's notorious and obvious, you really shouldn't be asking for more supporting documentation. But if it's like a mental health issue or it's an asthma issue, something you cannot readily um, discern, then you certainly can ask for supporting documentation. This next point is one that it kind of baffles me how many times people get this wrong. A lot of fraternities and sororities are pretty good about providing kind of pre-existing forms that members can fill out to request the accommodations. The shortfall that I've seen lately is that groups then thinking that unless the, their own forms are filled out, they don't have to honor a, um, a reasonable accommodation request. And that is not true. So you can certainly provide forms to be filled out, but you cannot force a member to only use your form. Basically, if they su submit or tell you anything that kind of looks like an accommodation request, it quacks like an accommodation request, it's going to be considered an accommodation request that needs to be taken very seriously. So don't insist upon certain forms, but certainly you can um, recommend that certain forms be filled out if they would facilitate your ability to evaluate it. Um, and again, you're going to want to be connect, assessing the connection between the alleged disability and the request to change. So if it's clear that they have a disability, but the actual modification or accommodation that they're asking has nothing to do with that um, disability, then that should be raising some red flags. Um, for example, we recently had a girl who um, requested to be able to have her have a dog in the property but the uh, disability that it was supposedly like helping was um, her ability to sleep. The problem was is that she kept the dog in a crate in the bathroom all night. So it wasn't helping her sleep in any way. So always look at the actual connection, if there is any, between what the alleged disability is and what change they're requesting. You also want to look at the feasibility. We'll come back to this here in a minute. But just because somebody makes a request doesn't necessarily mean it always has to be honored. Very rarely, it's a heavy burden to establish that it would be um, too burdensome on the housing provider to honor the request, but there are certain situations in which it would be too onerous to actually implement the requested modification or accommodation. And then again, you can always look at alternatives, but it, you you should never be insisting that an alternative be um, be accepted. All right, so emotional support animals, these are my two emotional support animals, Fritz and Charlie. I find every excuse I can to include them in my work. Um, but in all seriousness, there are different factors to consider here. And this goes back to what I was just talking about is the feasibility. So you should ask these two questions. Would granting the accommodation request result in an undue financial or administrative burden? Or would the accommodation request fundamentally alter the nature of the house? If the answer to either of those questions is yes, and you can definitively establish that, then you are not required to actually honor the requested modification or accommodation. Again, these are very heavy burdens to establish. The house corporation would have to prove that it would be an undue financial or administrative burden. Like it would just fundamentally alter the nature of what you guys do to honor this, to be able to get out of it. So usually you're going to probably have to be honoring these requests, but that doesn't mean there's always going to be a requirement. You also can look at, um, these are very specific to emotional support animals. Those first two questions apply to whatever type of request it is. These next two are obviously specific to um, animals in the house, but does this specific animal pose a direct threat to the health or safety of others that cannot be reduced or eliminated by another reasonable accommodation? And um, are you worried about that specific animal causing physical damage or potentially if it's like a known vicious dog about hurting others? These are valid considerations that could limit your um, duty to actually provide an accommodation. Okay, so there are certain things that I mentioned that you can ask for and certain things you cannot ask for. 
Keep in mind everything I'm about to say is if the disability, again, is open and notorious, obvious, just by looking at somebody, you really should not be making any informational requests. So what I'm about to talk about are more of those um, un unseen or not necessarily overt um, sorts of disabilities that are being alleged. So you can require, again, this goes back to animals, you can require about the need for the animal or the need for any sort of accommodation, the type of animal, Again, is it a vicious pit bull or is it a tiny little emotional support dog? Um, the description of the animal, the animal's name, you can ask if it's housebroken and you can also ask for vaccination information um, and, and so, so forth. In terms of medical documentation that you can ask for, you can ask for medical documentation and you can ask for this sort of information to be included, but you really shouldn't go beyond this. So you can ask, obviously, what is the nature or the type of disability, um, how those, how that person's disability or disabilities impact their major life activities. Um, and then for animals, the how the animal is necessary to provide the impaired student access to the fraternity housing. That's a specific one. It's not just like, can they have the, like, does the dog help them in general? It's is the dog necessary for them to be able to avail themselves of the benefits of living in the fraternity house? So it's not just, do they want it? It might help them feel better. It's, is it necessary? I don't want to use the word necessary, but um, is it fundamental to be able to access the fraternity house in a similar way to people who are not disabled? And then obviously the relationship between the disability and what the, um, what type of assistance the animal provides. Okay. I don't know if you guys already have these, but one of the best practices, a best practice that we recommend is to actually have sort of like an accommodation committee within your board that is designated to review all of the accommodation requests. This is important for ensuring consistency um, across all requests. So you don't have one person submitting a request that is approved and then another person submitting a nearly identical request that is denied. That's not going to be a good look. So if you have a committee or even just a few people who step up to review those for consistency, that's always great. So in an ideal world, you'll have that committee evaluating the request and will decide to either grant or deny the request. Um, then the committee would ideally put together a draft plan, which is then given to, let's say, the house corporation, um, either the president or if you have a house advisor, whoever is in a good position to be able to really tailor that plan to the individual member's needs. So it's a multi-step process. Um, and then this is what I mentioned before about the interactive process. It's probably the most important part of the accommodation analysis. And this is where a lot of disability um, violation claims really come up is that there was no interactive process. And this is really going a, a give and take with the member. You cannot say, this is what we're offering it, either take it or leave it. You really need to be working with the member to make sure that what you're proposing in your accommodation plan actually meets their needs. And again, make sure that they feel like they're part of the process. Studies do show that when people feel like they have their, their input has been provided and considered, they're much less likely to sue. So um, the more you involve the member in the process, the better. Things you cannot do, a lot of these have to do with just making things more expensive. So you cannot require pet deposits for an emotional service animal um, in the house. You cannot require liability insurance and you cannot um, charge a breakage fee for members seeking release due to medical issues. If they just want to, if they just want out of the house for non-medical issues, that's a totally different story. But you can't charge somebody more because they're requesting an accommodation or modification on account of their disability. Um, you can, however, especially with dogs, require indemnification. So if that dog ever ends up hurting somebody that you can require the member to sign something saying that they agree not to hold the house corporation liable for any damages that may stem from that. Um, you can also require restoration of damage. So if a dog chews up a door because it's left in a room, you can certainly um, go after the member for the damage to the property. And you can, of course, require licensing and vaccination and that the member care for the dog. Going back to that girl I mentioned before who left her dog in the bathroom, um, her roommate could not sleep because this dog was just howling at night. So you need to make sure that, and this goes back to the connection between the dog or the service animal and the, the alleged need. This girl was saying, I need the dog because it helps with my anxiety. 
but apparently she didn't have anxiety outside of the house when she was partying at 2 a.m because she would just leave the dog at home so again looking at the consistency and making sure that if they are saying they need the dog all the time for emotional support you can't just leave it at home whenever it's convenient for you and then um, you can require the a released member so somebody who's let out of the house to pay for an empty bed or i'm sorry you can require the chapter to cover that that's when you're under the lease to the chapter model which we'll come back to here in a minute so again it, it all come culminates in that accommodation plan ideally you should have the member sign it it should be in writing um and and you can consider different factors but again having the active input from the member is critical all right, I'm going to skip this because it doesn't really come up. I think we've covered the takeaways pretty well. So let's move on to talking about um, the role of the board member. And really the theme here is just stay in your lane to stay out of trouble. So you have two kind of um, categories of roles as a board member. You have your main function, functions, which are a fiduciary and an oversight. Those are more legal. You have a duty of care. So showing up to meetings, being informed of what's going on making sure things are running smoothly. But then you also have all these secondary functions, which are, um, you've probably been asked to be on the, the house court board for a reason. You, you probably have special skills, whether you're an attorney, a CPA, um, have some fundamental operational skills that you can bring, fundraising, um, recruitment of other people. So you have lots of different roles. Things that are not your job though are these. You are not a therapist. You are not a police officer. You can be a friend, but don't get too friendly. You're not their parent. You're not their caretaker. Stay in your lane. Remember that you were there as a fiduciary um, volunteer board member that you have legal obligations. And this becomes important because if you go above and beyond your duty and try to be somebody's therapist, for example, and we'll come back to this here in a minute, if you try to do something beyond the scope of what you're expected to do as a board member, you can actually then become um, liable if anything goes wrong. So when you assume a duty that you don't already have by virtue of being a board member, then you have a duty to do it properly or you could be potentially sued for negligence, which nobody wants that. This is um, unfortunately becoming more and more of a real concern for our clients to think about which is what happens when a member threatens suicide? What do we do with that information? Or how do we react as a board, as a house corporation? Again, stay in your lane. This is going to sound a little harsh, but you are a landlord. You are not their therapist. You are not a mental health professional unless that happens to be your day job. Um, and you, you are not at the end of the day responsible for individuals' mental health. So don't try to step in and save the day by any means. Instead, maybe refer them to campus health or actual mental health professionals that could help that know what they're doing, that they're trained to do that. And obviously get them that help sooner rather than later, but don't try to do it yourself. And, and remember that um, there are other people living in the house. So if somebody, for example, attempts suicide in the house, that's going to have an impact on your other residents. So make sure that other people feel supported as well. Don't neglect them while focusing on the one person who obviously needs some intervention, but again, it's not to come from you. Uh, chapter members on boards, just don't do it is really what we say. Um, going back to keeping in mind that you have fiduciary duties as a board member, um, you not only have fiduciary duties to the corporation, but you also have duties to each other. And what it means to be a good director is that you are performing your duties in good faith in the best interest of the whole corporation. And the corporation here is the house corporation. We're not talking about the chapter necessarily. We're talking about the house corporation board. Um, and then using it, exercising the care in the similar position and with ordinary um, care that a position in the similar sort of circumstances would also exercise. Where this really becomes tricky is this part. Whereas if a director obtains knowledge of violations of law or fraternity policy, that director, whoever it is, has a legal obligation to respond. That's part of the duty to act. Um, and while that duty is on each and every individual member of the board of directors, that knowledge that each person has is technically considered imputed to the rest of the board. And this becomes particularly problematic with chapter members um, on the board because they're also the friends of the people that are probably doing the 
the wrong acts, the wrongful misconduct, they're on one hand, they're not going to necessarily want to report their their fellow brothers to potentially get them in trouble. And that becomes a problem because if you do have an active member who knows about something that should be reported, it will be treated as if the whole board knew about that same thing and did nothing about it. So it really raises some liability concerns. Um, also, there may be situations in which, um, here it is, uh, you actually have no knowledge of the underlying violation. It, it could be there was a party at 2 a.m. and there was underage drinking going on. You have no idea because you weren't there. But if your chapter member who's also a board member was present and knows about it and then doesn't actually bring that to your attention, it's still the same as if you did as if you were there. So it really just comes with a lot of red flags. We certainly understand the appeal of having active brothers on the board, but if you can avoid it, we highly recommend doing so. All right, house corporation liability. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Again, stay in your lane and you'll probably be fine, but I do want to touch on that DNO insurance. So usually your national organization will have directors and officers insurance policies that will cover all affiliated organizations. It is still, of course, always a good idea to double check that um, to make sure that there is such a policy and that, that such a policy extends to your house corporation's directors. But um, assuming that it exists, whoops, um, assuming that it exists, then DNO insurance will usually cover your directors and officers with respect to any actions or decisions that they take as a board member, as long as those directors we're complying with their fiduciary duties. So again, as long as they're showing up to meetings, well-informed, asking questions, not just um, voting on things blindly, um, as long as they're putting the organization's interest before their own and avoiding conflicts of interest, there really is little risk to serving on a board. But um, we do certainly see issues where people are on boards and engaging in criminal activity and then somehow think that that's going to be covered by insurance. And Newsflash, it won't. So just stay in your lane and you should be fine. All right, knowing your occupancy agreement. So I mentioned before, there's a couple different leasing models. I'm going to touch on two here. The And these are the two big ones. So you have the lease to chapter model, which is the one that we usually recommend. The second is lease to member. And I'll go through each of these here. So of these two, the lease to chapter model is a lot better for these reasons. Number one, um, you won't be subject to, you likely will not be subject to the um, to any sort of landlord tenant acts. Each state's going to have different. So we put the uniform landlord tenant act just as kind of a catch all. But that's because a lease to a chapter is usually considered a commercial lease, not a residential lease. And so it wouldn't trigger all of the normal landlord tenant rights that a, a residential tenant would have. It also puts a lot of the overhead on the chapter. And then it it just is a lot easier to administer. And um, you you can protect against um, assignment of to different members. So like if there's somebody who shouldn't be living in the house, then you might have a little bit more control over that. So it's just fundamentally easier. There's also a lot less risk. Um, there's certainly always risk, but if you have this kind of three-step level where it goes the house corporation to the chapter who then subleases out to individual members, if somebody ever gets hurt, certainly they're going to name all potential parties but you have an extra layer of protection that you wouldn't otherwise have if you go with the second model, which is a leasing to member model. Again, if you go with this, it's gonna be most likely treated similar to a residential lease. So you'll probably have the application of the local landlord tenant laws. There's lots of overhead, like I just mentioned, lots of risks. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call your, at the end of the day, their lease agreements. So if you call them an occupancy agreement, a license. A license is technically different from a lease. Um, a license is just a permission to use a space, whereas a lease is um, permission to, it, it's basically a contract and a right to occupy. It doesn't really matter what you call it. At the end of the day, courts are going to probably treat most of your housing agreements as lease agreements that would trigger that landlord tenant laws. Um, you also have to deal with deposits then. So you are allowed to have non-refundable application deposits or fees, but they do become really problematic when you administer the um, refunds of deposits because especially if there is damage to a, a, a wall 
in the common areas and you charge, you deduct that from some people's deposits, but not from others, you're going to have some explaining to do. So it's a lot more work. It's certainly feasible. Um, but you also run the risk here that if one person moves out, you're going to have to go after them and you won't necessarily have anybody as a fallback responsible for the money unless you have like a parent as a cosigner. Whereas with the lease to chapter model, you can still hold the chapter responsible for covering the cost of any unleased, unrented rooms in the house. So again, just to recap, we recommend the lease to chapter model. It is possible, though, a lot more difficult to do the lease to member model. Uh, this one is, is probably my favorite part, just because there are such mixed feelings about this. And this concerns uh, security cameras in the house. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of both exterior security cameras and interior. If you're gonna have them, we generally recommend only having them on the exterior. Interiors present a lot of different problems that can come back to bite you in the butt a little bit. Exterior can be really good for deterring other people from breaking in, from doing some shady things. It's good for security. Um, it's also good for after the fact investigation. So we just had a matter recently where a girl was accusing a guy of taking her into the fraternity house and we reviewed the cameras and we see him going in, but she's nowhere to be seen. So it can be pretty good for, for kind of proving things like that. But at the same time, it will capture the comings and goings of members and guests. And so we recommend that you have very clear signs that people are being recorded so they don't feel like they're being their privacy is being invaded. Um, but you also, if you're going to actually have them for the deterrence effect, you got to make sure people actually know they're there. So make them pretty obvious. Um, the, the potential problem can become, though, if you don't monitor them, this is going to be a problem with interior as well, just not monitoring or not having a process for monitoring them or who can monitor them. So just keep that in mind. Interior, as I mentioned, we generally advise against them. They're usually not great deterrents. Um, once people are inside their home, they sometimes, especially when intoxicated, forget that they're there. And so they're just going to do whatever they want anyways. It does capture a lot of activity, but there can become a problem when, let's say, after the fact, you say, oh, yeah, we have security cameras. We'll be able to show that X, Y, Z did or did not happen. But if somebody has gone down and messed with the cameras or turned them off somehow or repositioned them, then you suddenly don't have the video footage. And that actually creates more of an issue and um, something you're going to have to be able to explain of why you don't have the this footage when you supposedly were recording everything going on inside. And so m I would say because of that potential tampering issue, unless you have these security cameras, um, like the, the control to them locked up or only accessible by certain people, which we would obviously recommend, they can create more of a headache than it was than it's worth. Um, again, the issue becomes who's monitoring them if anybody and making sure people, uh, even more so than with the exterior ones, are aware that they're there. Most people don't have don't have a right to privacy that they could assert with respect to exterior um, cameras. So it's fair game to record people in an area outside where they wouldn't normally have an expectation of privacy. However, people generally do have expectations of privacy in the interiors. So you want to make sure you're not potentially um, crossing some lines with what you're recording and where you're recording. So no matter where, if you're going to have interior, exterior cameras, these are different things to consider. I've mentioned some of them, um, but who gets to see the footage? When and why would we actually review the footage? Where are we placing the receiver? When can the footage be reviewed? When? How long are we keeping it? And how do we communicate all of this to the chapter so that they know that every everybody's on the same page? Um, again, these are just to summarize here. We don't recommend interior cameras, but always remember, think about why you are you want to install the cameras and then make sure you're actually accomplishing that goal. Because if you're just putting cameras up to put up cameras, it doesn't make much sense. You could run into some issues. But if you're saying we need a camera to prevent people from trying to break into this side door on Friday and Saturday nights, then make sure your your operations actually match that goal. Okay, so touchy subject is what do you do when somebody won't pay? Well, you got a problem. And this usually comes up mostly just under the, um, in the the chap the lease to individual members model. Because like I said, if you lease to the chapter and somebody moves out, then the chapter can still be on the hook for, for that room cost. So this is mostly just applicable in the individual member lease context. 
it's very difficult. Um, I, do, I do a lot of eviction work here in Cincinnati on behalf of non-paternal clients, and it's a pain in the butt to go through the whole process for an eviction. And it's also a problem for collecting any monetary damages. So no matter where you are, um, if you're faced with either of these issues, collections or evictions, we always recommend getting legal help. Um, in Ohio, at least, and I'm sure this is the case in most states as well, it's considered the unauthorized practice of law for a corporation, whether it's incorporated or not, any business entity to represent itself in court. So you have to be represented by an attorney if you're an LLC, if you're a corporation or anything like that. So collections, uh, there's lots of federal rules like the Fair Debt Collection Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act to be aware of. It's heavily regulated, so you really should consult an expert. Same with evictions. Um, depending on which state you're in, the there may be a landlord's duty to mitigate, which means you have a duty to try to re-rent the premises. Um, it just gets very complicated. Now, I will say there are some jurisdictions across the country that explicitly exclude from their landlord tenant laws any sort of fraternity or student housing. So you want to check to see if you're even um, even kind of part of that um, if you if you have to follow those rules. But um, there are it's it is a timely and expensive process, especially if you have to hire an attorney to represent you in court. Um, so it, if if you can avoid it, it's best to. But it, inevitably, it will come up at some point in time. Uh, do not change the locks or otherwise try to self-help by like turning off the utilities or locking somebody out of their room. Just don't do that in almost every state that I'm aware of. It's illegal for a landlord to do that until you've gotten a writ of eviction, which means you've gone to court and actually gotten a judgment from uh, from the court to be able to evict the person. And like I said, in a lot of jurisdictions, the Landlord Tenant Act will be pretty um, favorable to tenants unless you're not subject to the landlord tenant law. So just be aware of what your local rules are. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of this, but they are some different um, concerns that it, it, the ULTA would be the Uniform Landlord Tenant Act. So again, just make sure that you're aware of what your local landlord tenant acts, if they are applicable, what they require, and make sure you're complying with them. And again, as I mentioned, always hire an attorney for collections or evictions. The sooner you get an attorney involved, the better. It's a lot easier for an attorney to just do it right from the outset rather than try to come in once you've already made a few mistakes, try to clean those up and then also um, get it back on track. So the sooner you can get involved, probably the cheaper it's going to be and save yourself some hassle. Okay, before I open up to questions, just a few quick things I wanted to touch on that I personally have seen kind of coming up as more and more um, of hot topics lately. I mentioned in the beginning the zoning. I deal with this a lot, not necessarily in the zoning context, but in terms of trying to save university recognition for our groups, because in certain jurisdictions, for example, Bloomington, Indiana, I think they've changed the code now. But it used to be um, that if you lost your university recognition for whatever reason, and when I say you, I mean the chapter, if they are no longer recognized, if they're suspended for different policy violations, then it is potentially going to result in the house corporation no longer being able to rent that property to a fraternity or sorority, which can have major implications, especially because it is difficult to find a whole fraternity to rent that um, rent the property in the meantime, while the group is kicked off campus. So something to be very aware of, I think we're going to see more and more jurisdictions try to enact more restrictive zoning regulations that also can um, make the zoning eligibility contingent upon university recognition. And that's going to be very concerning because as the landlord, as the house corporation, you don't really get to participate in the university disciplinary proceedings. So you could have your whole house's occupancy taken away from you in a matter of weeks without ever having a say in it. So this is where it can become important to also have positive working relationships with your chapter members and the advisors so that you guys are aware of what's going on if there are ever any disciplinary um, charges pending against the chapter. State hazing laws, um, make sure you're familiar with what the state hazing laws are in your state. For example, in Ohio, Within the last year, they passed what's called the Collins Law, 
which is um, kind of a lot more onerous than others in the state. But Ohio's law now requires anybody, includes, arguably including House directors and volunteers, that are aware of hazing, like um, that have reasonable knowledge of existing hazing concerns to report it to authorities. And if you don't, then you can be responsible. So just make sure you're aware of what your obligations are under the state law. And then finally, just employment issues. Um, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about like your cooks, your housekeepers and so forth. The best idea is to actually hire vendors to avoid any sort of employment issues. But if you are going to directly employ any sort of um, cooks, housekeepers, whatever, on behalf of the house, you want to make sure you're aware of the FLSA, the um, Fair Labor Standards Act, particularly with respect to overtime payments. Um, you need to be cognizant of whether the FLSA characterizes those individuals as exempt or non-exempt employees. Most of the time, your employees will be considered non-exempt, which can become particularly problematic if you don't pay them overtime if their work ever goes over 40 hours a week. Um, if you think about when a house advisor, for example, is probably most likely going to be needed, it may be in those emergency after hours on the weekends um, where they've already worked 40 hours during the week, so then you run into overtime issues. If, if you're concerned about something like that, one recommendation we always have is to actually start your work week on a Thursday um, instead of a Monday or a Sunday, because that way, um, if, if they kind of use up the 40 hours on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they can take time off without having to go into overtime on your Tuesdays and Wednesdays to avoid those overtime issues. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop. Um, there's my contact information. So if after today you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to connect with you guys, or you can send them through your house corporation. But what questions do you guys have? I know we have a few in the chat. Let's see here. Um, oh, well, thank you. Okay, that's not a question. Okay, are there any questions? I, I can't see the q and A. I guess I could exit out here. And brothers, at, at this time, we will just open it up to a general discussion. Uh, for, for everyone involved in the call. Alana, thank you again uh, for the presentation. As you can see in the chat, it's been very well received and uh, very relevant um, as far as a lot of the topics that you covered tonight. So brothers, we'll open it up, kind of an open mic town hall type of session. So any questions that you have, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask Alana. As we said, this is the Ask the Expert session. So Hi, Alana. I have a question for you. I, I do a lot of work with risk management and, and insurance, and we continue to see on the premises liability side a continued expansion of the expectations of security and um, you know the ability to provide a safe space and living environment for folks from a habitational perspective, from a residency life standpoint. Mm -hmm. Are you are you noticing any trends? in legal suits against housing corporations for assault and battery type issues which are occur which can occur on premises um, or um, you know absent the uh, sexual abuse and molestation type issues more physical fights and things that you know can be more common amongst individuals of younger ages sure that's a great question um i wouldn't necessarily say i've seen an influx or an increase in those sorts of lawsuits I think that they're always going to exist, unfortunately. I think people are per perhaps becoming more litigious and willing to bring these lawsuits than they may have been um, 20, 15 years ago, for example. I think people are just like, well, let's just file a lawsuit. But I also think that, um, and this has been true, that people are generally a little hesitant to bring these lawsuits because of discovery. And for those of you who are not lawyers and have never been sued, you're fortunate, but um, discovery is essentially an, your records, your your mental health, your physical health, your records are potentially subject to disclosure to the other side in cases. Um, you could have to reveal a bunch of information about yourself that you don't want to. So people are pretty hesitant to actually have to go through that process. And we do see a lot of lawsuits that get filed that don't actually ever make it to trial because people just dismiss their cases when they don't want to turn over the discovery. Um, so I wouldn't say there's an influx of them, but I think you are still going to always have them, which is why we're we're thinking about things like security cameras and how to protect the, the house corporation. Because if you guys can establish like, look, 
we knew about a problem of fights breaking out in our backyard between these ex these hours. So we decided to start monitoring it. And then once we were, this is, this is another problem too with security cameras. If you don't monitor it, they're kind of useless. But if you can then say like, look, we went back, we, we reviewed it. We identified who the problem people were. We talked to those people. Here's our clear documented record of what we did to try to address that. I think it does potentially help protect the, the house corporation more than just doing nothing, certainly. Any other questions? David, you are muted. I can see you trying to talk. Is this better? Can you hear me? There you go. Okay. Um, talking about the security cameras, and you suggested not having the security cameras inside the physical structure of the house. Mm -hmm. um, what do you consider, if you have outside security cameras, um, how often the monitoring should, what's a reasonable amount of monitoring is my question. I think it really depends on going back to what's your goal of putting them up. So like I just said, if you know that you always are having these fights on the weekends, maybe you should be monitoring them every weekend for a little while till you see what the problem is and then you can maybe take action. And then once you start to see the problem decreasing or not happening as frequently, then maybe tailor it back. I would probably check them, have somebody checking them at least once a week, but it, if you have something to check for. I mean, I've got a ring security camera outside my house. And if I tried to monitor that, it, it picks up like 24 seven every time a car goes by. There's not much to monitor. So I wouldn't have somebody just monitoring it just to watch it. But if you're looking for something, I think that will be more informative of how often you should be looking at them as well. And you may not need to look at them when people aren't on campus. So like if it's summer break, you're not gonna need to look at them nearly as much as you would during the first weekend back or something like that. So I think you you kind of have to tailor them for what your individual campus is like and what your needs are with the cameras. Yeah. Okay, so there should be a reason basically what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to just having the cameras is pointless um, unless you just are, I mean, if you're, if you're purely looking for a deterrent, just put up a fake camera at that point. But yeah. if you are trying to curb an issue or address an issue, or you're trying to, I mean, if you know somebody broke in on Thursday night between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., obviously go back as soon as possible and watch those. You will also want to be paying attention to how long your um, security system retains the footage. So if the footage is only being kept for, let's say, six weeks or 60 days, if you know that, then you need to have somebody go back through before those videos are expired just to make sure that there's nothing major red flag popping up in them. So it really depends on kind of what your your time frame is in terms of the videos being retained um, and whether you may need to uh, trans transmit them to an external drive for any purpose. Um, and I, and with that in mind too, like if you do see something that's like, hmm, wonder what that is, but you don't know like, oh, that's definitely gonna lead to a lawsuit. If you haven't been served with a what's called a litigation hold letter, which basically means don't destroy anything, if if a video is no longer available after six weeks and somebody says 12 weeks later, hey, I need this video from that night, you don't have an obligation to like go out of your way to find that video, just so you guys know. Thank you. JB, you've got your hand up. What can I answer for you? Okay. okay. Uh, if the house corporation leases to the chapter, as is suggested, then the undergraduate chapter would then lease to the residents. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the previous thinking was, let's say that resident uh, was accused of drug use or sexual assault. Um, if the house corporation was the landlord, then they could remove the resident from the house without affecting his brotherhood status until proven or convicted. So does, so does that put the chapter, the chapter leadership in a weird spot to evict a current member? It certainly does. Um, and this is something I'd be checking your individual state landlord tenant laws as well. Um, so if it's and, and in all not in all states is the uh, lease to chapter who then chapter uh, chapter to member model not 
every state will recognize that as a commercial transaction. So sometimes you may still be in the Landlord Tenant Act, um, but you can have as part of your lease agreement with the chapter requirements that if they become aware of any sort of like criminal activity, that they are required to take the same sort of action that you guys would want to take against the individual member directly. So if you um, want at the end of the day, the result to be in your situ in your example, that the individual would be removed from the house, but not necessarily from membership, you can make that a requirement, an expectation of the chapter that the chapter will do whatever is necessary to remove from the premises anybody who's engaging in illegal drug use. Um, I think that is totally reasonable. So it's just a matter of tailoring your, your agreement with the chapter to meet your needs. And that's something too that legal counsel can always assist with um, and tailor those agreements exactly in that sort of way. And then you also, you do have recourse then too. The House Corporation has recourse against the um, the chapter if the chapter fails to do so. If if you find out that they know about somebody using drugs and do nothing, then you can impose um, sanctions against the chapter if necessary. Sorry to interrupt whoever was just about to say something. That's okay. Thank you, Alana. Uh, to kind of piggyback off that, off various discussions I've had with John and other members of the Housing Advisory Committee, of course, we're seeing an influx of uh, overdoses as well, um, not just in chapter houses, but just nationally. Is there any sort of policy when it comes to Narcan or any other uh, resources available to individuals as it relates to that matter? That's a great question. And um, unfortunately, you hear on the news stories now about, I forget what it's called, but the one that's not even um, reversible with Narcan that is just is just tragic. Um, it becomes a, an issue kind of going back to your duty and not exceeding your duty. Um, if you're going to have something like Narcan in the house, you need to make sure that people know what to do with it and when to use it. So there would really need to be sufficient training around that. I, I mean, it's probably great to have it around. Usually most campuses have it somewhere like an, as an emergency resource. Um, so I would be a little hesitant to have it in the house, but I understand why some people would want it in there. I think it just comes down to making sure people are very well trained and aware that this is not a toy. Um, don't mess with it unless it unless you have to. So I, I think that's something that there can be a policy, but you really have to make sure it's being enforced and um, an educational programming is done around it. Anything else? Hi, Alana. Hello. This is Bill Miller. In case you didn't know, you probably knew this already, but the chapter at Indiana University built a new house several oh. years ago in the center of campus, which cost $14 million. And their site now is leveled. So you, if, if you were in law school now, you would not get challenged with all the noise from the chapter house. You know, I always liked the Fiji house. Um, I will. It, it, I wasn't mad. I wish they were a little bit quieter when I was trying to make that narrated PowerPoint, but I had no problem with the Fiji house. They they loved that site. They hated to leave it, even though it was on the edge of campus, because you walk through Dunn Woods for two minutes before you got to class. Right. And uh, they, they were there for over 100 years, but it's... Uh, it finally, it, it had to happen. And they're, and they're happy where they are, too. So Good. it's a great place. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are any other questions, um, again, feel free to either reach out to um, to John or Dio and they can get it to me or you can contact me directly. It does get a little messy when multiple people are emailing me. But if it's just like a quick question or you want to follow up with anything that we were talking about, I'm happy to help. Um, but if there are no further questions, it's been a, a privilege speaking with you all tonight. Please don't be strangers. Hopefully you won't need us for any reason, but we are always here to support you in any way that we can if any issues arise going forward, okay? And Alana, thank you again for your time. Uh, brothers, thank, thank you. you again for participating tonight. If any questions do come up, feel free to direct them to either myself, John, or just email us at housing at bygam.org. But brothers, again, I thank you for um, joining us tonight. And Alana, thank you for your presentation and joining us tonight as well. No problem. I just saw the question pop up. I'm happy to share the slides. Um, I'll share them with
with the 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 Dio and John, and then um, if you guys want to distribute them as you wish, I'm happy to do that as well. That's perfect. Thank all you, right, Alana. guys. Have a good night. Others, thank you all. Have a great rest of your night. Bye.